that communication stressed that climate change and natural disasters and environmental degradation, they are interlinked and have far reaching impact on resilience of communities. Quite obvious, but important that this is part of, um, uh, of such a joint communication. Let me take you to January of this year, um, conclusions on climate and energy diplomacy. So the Foreign Affairs Council, that is all the ministers of foreign affairs of the European Union, they recalled that they see climate change and environmental degradation as a threat to international stability and security. And they, the EU member states agreed that their foreign and security policy would systematically consider climate and environmental factors and risks um, within their work, and that they would work with partners to develop conflict prevention measures, such as early warning systems and um, uh, support to relevant international instruments. Okay, that's all nice, you may think. Uh, it's a good indication of the commitment. It's not very operational so far. So let me tell you two words about the EU concept on climate and security, as was presented to the uh, uh, Political and Security Committee only last week, um, and where it was uh, welcomed by the EU member states. So that concept, really aims to increase the impact of EU's external action on peace and security. And it does that by ensuring that climate and security nexus is being respected everywhere. Um, and that includes considering issues like environmental degradation. And then we address that in all relevant EU activities in this field. So that concept provides uh, the external dimension of the European Green Deal. And it really hopes to or gives a framework for operational approaches and principles when addressing these linkages between climate change, environmental degradation, and peace and security. So here we start to see, and if you would read that concept, references to conflict prevention, to early warning, to CSDP missions, and indeed to mediation. So let's zoom in a bit more on mediation. So we have a mediation concept, it, it, this is all public, so if, if, if you're not part of the EU, then, then you can certainly read all these documents. Um, and we have guidance for practitioners, and this guidance includes how to deal with um, environmental issues. In my own team, I'm really investing in people that, that become experts in this. Uh, we are providing training, some of the training supported by uh, people that are uh, participating today. Um, and maybe, uh, as I haven't mentioned it yet, the European Commission will spend over the next seven years 25 billion euro on climate mitigation and adaptation, just to give you that context. Why are we doing all of this? Well, I don't have to mention that here. Let me just quote my, my own boss, uh, uh, the High Representative Josep Borrell. He said in his recent blog, that climate change is the biggest security risk in human history. So I think that that says a lot about how serious this is. Um, we organized a community of practice in April of this year. There we listed a few dynamics. Um, so I will not go into detail on how climate change will affect conflicts. Let me just list those four. So climate change amplifies social and economic dynamics in different ways. Uh, um, there are four that were mentioned here. It worsens livelihoods. It motivates increased migration and changes mobility patterns. It modifies the tactics of armed groups. And here, uh, radicalization uh, is, is, is mentioned as well. And it increases the risk of unequal resource management and exploitation. Not a secret that this, this is mainly a, a, a real concern in countries where you have weak governments and where you have weak government citizen relationships. Um, you know, I had to think of, of what happened in the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany in the summer when there were these floodings. The first thing that citizens do is criticize their governments. So that is a very normal response. 
Let me now take you to the five suggestions where I think we can, uh, we can better work together. Um, and I do that from a realization that I actually think there is no difference in agenda between us. I think we all agree on, on, on the same objectives and we all have this very strong realization that we need everyone on board to, to really make a difference here. And from that sort of commonality, um, let me mention the following five, and I, I will be fast. The first is that climate change happens, of course, in a specific context, in a specific social political context, affecting some groups more than others. So local is key. Local, as in, in really uh, subnational. And of course, civil society is the first to assist at that level. Here, two challenges. How do we bring the local lessons to a national level? How do we translate that to national or maybe even regional levels, think the African Union? And how do we enhance that capacity of local governments? There's no way that the EU or any other international organization is able to do that. How can we work better on this? Uh, make sure that early warning systems are in place and mediation structures as well in case it does go wrong. Second and related, well, you indeed, civil society organizations play an incredibly important role here. One of the challenges is that a lot of good experiences are often locked in projects, are not shared. How do we, how do we scale up? How do we make sure that these good experiences are being used and scaled up and scaled up fast because this requires urgent action. Third, all climate adaptation needs to be conflict sensitive. There's no such thing as a purely technical solution to climate change adaptation. And as climate variability increases and natural resources become scarcer, adaptation becomes more political and more sensitive and more difficult. So everyone that is supporting climate change adaptation programs, no matter how technical they may see, you should always do that based on uh, a good understanding of local sources uh, in relation to resilience, conflict analysis, etc. We try to do that ourselves, and I would really want to know how the NGO community does that. Um, often I recognize NGOs that are either focused on climate adaptation or indeed are peace building NGOs and not a lot are able to bring these two worlds together. We struggle with that as well. And I would really want to learn from you how you are doing this. Let me give you one example. I heard it yesterday, so I can't tell you too much about this. Um, there is funding provided to two pilot projects, one in Darfur, one in Nepal. EU funding to local community dispute, dispute resolution mechanisms on natural resources. And what they find in, in these two pilots is that in 70% of the cases, they are successful. Um, this is, as it is a pilot, very well monitored and documented. So I hope that in the future, I can tell you more about this. Fourth, we see sometimes dialogue and environmental issues as an entry point for negotiation. And sometimes that's true. Um, I recently had an experience where uh, in the Middle East peace process, a party from the Palestinian side and from the Israeli side during the meeting actually agreed that they would only be able to find a solution to their common problems if they would sit together, a great example. But we also see that it can be highly politicized. Think about the, the GERD, the great Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. So how do we make sure that these issues don't become a zero sum game? Think herder farmers, think about dams in rivers, etc. Because that will make this a lot more difficult. We are starting to gain some experience in this, but I would really welcome your insights on what works and what doesn't work. And the last one, platforms like this are absolutely excellent. Can we build further on these? Can we unpick maybe some of the areas that I've mentioned and take them further and really start to talk about these issues at a, at a greater level of granularity and of detail? I probably extended my time already. Let me stop here. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Renee. And now I'll pass straight over to Emma Whitaker, who is the Peace and Conflict Advisor at Mercy Corps. Emma, over to you. Thanks, Laura. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great, thanks. Um, it's great to be here with everybody today and as part of the um, Berlin Climate Security Conference. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking to you from the perspective of a practitioner um, NGO that um, uh, works in contexts characterized by fragility and crises, um, places like Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, Colombia, Mali, um, sort of the world over. And I'm gonna be talking to you about our experience um, in climate sensitive mediation and negotiation. Um, so I think there's a few slides if uh, Lorenzo, you wanna add those up. Um, thank you, but I'll, I'll, I'll get started anyways. Um, so we actually have a large um, peace building portfolio, some 50 active programs. Um, but we work, and you can go sec right to the second slide. Um, we actually work across the humanitarian peace and development spectrum, um, which we think gives us a unique um, vantage point and opportunity to integrate approaches that allow us to meet not only sort of acute um, and urgent needs, but also address the underlying systemic issues that create and perpetuate um, conditions of fragility. So Mercy Corps predominantly works at the subnational level, um, and we work with individuals and communities to ladder up to affect um, societal level change. And we work um, to prevent, sorry, prevent and reduce violent conflict and advance sustainable peace by um, transforming norms, perceptions, and institutions to be more just and inclusive. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, in 2004, we merged with the Conflict Management Group. Um, which actually marks more or less when our peace building practice took shape um, with some of our earliest work focusing on intercommunal peace building related primarily to resources. Um, and so using an adapted methodology from Roger Fisher, um, who is a world renowned negotiation expert um, and author of the book, Getting to Yes. Um, so our adapted methodology, which we call um, interest-based negotiation or IBN for short, was really designed to ensure that our program participants had the skills um, and confidence to address a broad range of conflicts and challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, this approach utilizes existing social structures and institutions to, to separate the people from the problem and focus on interests and not positions and creates options for mutual gain um, and defines objective criteria against which to judge the fairness of sort of end agreements. Um, so since 2004, Mercy Corps has implemented more than 60 programs around the world um, using mediation and negotiation, and we've trained a global cadre of more than 2,000 experts um, across 22 countries who are supporting um, conflict management in their communities today. Um, our approach to mediation and negotiation is about developing sustainable conflict management skills, um, and these skills are really sort of future-proof to, to suit a changing sort of landscape and sources of risk. Um, if you go to the next slide, Mercy Corps utilizes um, these universal skills for conflict management as a part of a two-pronged approach really um, with conflict management on the one side, um, paired with addressing the context specific deeper drivers of conflict on the other. And this can be anything from sort of governance related grievances to economic inequality or food insecurity. Um, and so while our uh, interest-based negotiation work is universally applicable across a variety of conflict themes and typologies, um, what we've really seen from our global programs is that climate change, um, and this won't be surprising to anyone on this call, um, climate change and resource grievances are now really a part of the undercurrent of every conflict around the world from everywhere from you know, Myanmar to Colombia. And therefore that the majority of our programs that are utilizing mediation and negotiation are actually being used to address disputes and challenges related to the environment or um, climate change specifically. Um, so for Mercy Corps, by focusing on mediation and negotiation as a universal skill set, paired with addressing the sort of deeper rooted conflict grievances, um, we think we're, we're supporting communities to be more resilient to conflict over time and really building the foundations for communities to um, collaboratively and cohesively address the factors of fragility, which climate change exacerbates. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, so what does this all actually look like in practice? Um, I'll tell you the story of a man named Dengara Emmanuel um, that Mercy Corps works with in Koji State in Nigeria. And this is in Nigeria's North and Middle Belt. Um, uh, Dengar is a 35-year-old youth leader and Christian farmer, 
Um, and in Koji state, um, conflicts between farmers and herders are rampant with over sort of 3,600 um, deaths in one year alone and, and thousands more displaced as a result of conflict. Um, so in Koji state, rising temperatures and erratic rainfall have intensified um, resource competition between farmers and herders. And this is both shifting traditional migratory patterns and exacerbating intercommunal violence. Um, and so while the source of the dispute is really over changing resource availability, um, we've seen tensions have taken on an ethnic and religious undertone. Um, and this is due to the overwhelming population of nomadic herders um, being Muslim Fulani and farmers being from sort of various ethnic Christian groups. Um, so for Dangara, um, on your screen on the left, um, him and his peers in the Bukamba community um, cattle, uh, face cattle encroachment, um, resulting in cap crop destruction, um, which is posing a sort of daily challenge um, as the community lacked a defined grazing route to allow passage of Fulani cattle to allocated um, grazing areas. So this destruction um, has the same simmering tensions between the two groups and it's threatening the livelihoods of both groups. Um, so through a program called SIP that Mercy Corps is currently implementing in Nigeria, um, in January 2020, Dangara, his fellow farmers and Fulani herders participated in an interest-based negotiation and mediation training. Um, after the training and determined to find a lasting and mutually beneficial solution, Dangara and his peers actually reached out to the Fulani herders and together the two groups recognized that peace uh, would not be sustainable or ensured until there was an adequate passage for cattle and protection of crops. Um, so together, um, a route was proposed and jointly agreed upon, and the journey, uh, sorry, and the groups jointly cleared um, the route for easy passage of the cattle from Fulani settlements into um, the grazing areas. Um, and so now the community meets on the fr last Friday of every month, and Dangara says um, we are able to relate as brothers and sisters. Um, so we found that, actually, if you go to the next slide, um, in a randomized control trial of the SIP program, we found that only 29% of respondents in communities with interest-based negotiation trained local leaders reported experiencing a violent conflict in the past six months. And this is compared to a higher rate of 55% of respondents in control communities um, who, who reported a much higher incidence of violence in the last six months. Um, so overall, we found the program increased trust and positive interactions, and it built the foundations for social cohesion and collaboration. And combined with the joint programs that SIP um, specifically addressed um, sort of root causes, including um, focusing on economic, um, natural resource management, or social service needs, um, actually increased overall perception of security um, in the program areas. Um, and so we find that, you know, mediation is often used to stop violence or quell violence once it's already erupted. Um, but to build sustainable peace, communities need to be supported with both universal conflict management skills on the one hand and on the other with the resources and opportunities to address root causes of conflict on the other. Um, and so if you go to the last slide, I'll just leave you with two sort of takeaways and, and um, how we view um, NGOs and the EU can work together to advance sustainable peace. The first is really around pairing peace process that halt violence um, with concrete interventions that build trust between groups and address underlying fragility. And these are the underlying fragility factors that create the vulnerability um, that climate change can exacerbate. And the second is really investing in improving the mediation capabilities of local leaders. Um, this has been found to be a cost effective conflict management method um, that reduces violence and improves uh, security overall. Um, so I'll leave it there and thanks so much um, and looking forward to the conversation ahead. Thank you very much indeed, Emma. And now I'd like to turn to Sebastian Kratzer, who is the Project Manager for Analysis and Evaluation at the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue. Sebastian, over to you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, so I very much like the framing of this session, I must say, um, because I think it's starting to take us away from just looking at the problem of how climate and conflict are interlinked and really pushes the conversation to how do we better address it in peace work and specifically in peace processes. Um, so I'm coming in from the HD Center, which is a very specialized mediation and dialogue organization that focuses on resolving, preventing and mitigating armed conflict through negotiations. And we work across all levels of peace processes. So from the very local to the national and the international level. And we're dealing 
really with political leaders at all levels. So with political leaders of countries and of communities. Um, so I think it's a nice compliment maybe to the perspective that Emma just presented. And I really wanted to make um, two points here. One maybe on the current practice of how we see climate change environment and peace processes interlink. And then the second one on a bit of the future and how we see potentially better cooperation between the EU or other official actors and civil society. Um, on the first point, so the current practice of peace processes and climate change, I think we can sum it, we can sum the picture up in, in two points mainly. First, that so far there has been lack of appropriate action addressing environment, climate change and peace processes and negotiations. But second, and that's the upside, that we're also seeing the field rapidly expanding its tools and practices on these issues. And there's a lot of positive development. Um, I think two years ago, internally, we commissioned a, a quick study to look at peace agreements and how they address environment. And I think the conclusion was then less than 20% over the last 10 years had an addressed environment in relevant terms and only a handful of agreements had ad explicitly addressed climate change in a meaningful way but more so it came out that there's also a bad way of doing it that um, if you address the environment or natural resources more too much from an eco economic perspective or a resource exploitation perspective it might actually be harmful to the environment um, so for us, the question that really came up is um, the how to incorporate these considerations into negotiations and not just the, that we should do it. Um, but as I said, on the upside, we do see that the practice is changing and it's changing fast and in the right direction. I think as a basic point, what we see internally at HD is that and since the standard tools of mediation, dialogue, negotiations, just like Emma pointed out now, they do apply very well to the environmental and climate change issues that drive conflict. Um, but we also see that there is a lot of space to, to um, be innovative, that there's a lot of space to develop more specific tools and to re really refine our existing approaches, a bit what Rene just mentioned. And I just wanted to very briefly um, share a few rapid fire examples from HD's work, um, because to complement what Emma said, what we're seeing in our work is that really broadly the environment or climate change issues cover all tracks and levels of peace process. So from the very local, um, that's as Emma explained, to the interstate level and a lot of action on the regional level. Um, and at HD, I think what we're seeing is across the Sahel, across Nigeria, our teams are busy negotiating local level peace agreements and more and more those contain natural resource clauses and dispute mechanisms, but that also more and more, they're actually negotiating dedicated resource sharing agreements. Um, and when we then move up to national or interstate level, if you, um, often on a track, track two, track one level, we can see that we see ecological dialogue being run across contact lines, across front lines between warring parties as a very good way of bringing them together, often as Rene said, as an entry point or as an issue in itself that is being resolved. Um, and for example, in Asia, to in dealing with um, a close regime, the issues of forestry function as a very good um, entry point. But I think a lot of action that we are witnessing is actually happening at the regional level on track 1.5, you, you could call it, um, where we are convening policymakers and experts from really across regions to identify practical steps, practical solutions to, to solve issues around climate and conflict that interlink. Um, just as an example, in the South China Sea, we had very informal dialogues with, with, the, with the states surrounding the South China Sea on all kinds of issues such as Coast Guard interaction, fisheries, pollutions, and that all that has worked, I'd say, really well in, in developing feasible and sustainable solutions. And I'll get back to that actually in how the EU can fit into that. Um, 
At the same time, we're seeing also more of a growing global practice in terms of designing better support, better guidance for mediators. There has, there is a bit of material out there. There's a UN guide on natural resources and mediation and a few others, but they all tend to be quite high level still. And I think what we're seeing is really a need to, to break it down, um, to make it more accessible, to make it more useful for the insider mediators, for the people running the show on the ground. Um, and so I'll leave it there at the first point of the current practice, because I wanted to just dedicate a minute or two to how we see potentially a few ideas for the way ahead and how EU, the EU and civil society could better cooperate. And I actually like, really liked uh, Rene's intervention because I wanted to start this second point by saying that at every conference we go to on this topic, we hear people um, talking about the problem, about how climate change and conflict interlinked. And it's an important topic, but we never really hear enough about potential solutions. And we are here to get stuff done. We want to really look at how we can do it better. So I was really happy that Rene was already pushing us in that direction. Um, and so I thought, I'll try my luck at a few concrete ideas of how the EU and civil society could cooperate, how we see it from a mediation organization's perspective. Um, and again, that happens across all levels of peace processes, I think, on really the track one, 1 1.5, um, engagements we see at HD, but other civil society organi organizations, they have become very good at developing and testing practical and sustainable solutions for some of these issues, um, which is often possible because it happens in informal settings where states feel more free to open up um, and feel more prepared to come with technical solutions that they find acceptable. Um, but then to make these solutions adapted and part of the more formal and official realm, it needs, we need to take them back to the formal players. And I think that's where players like the EU, the OSCE, the UN, etc., can play a very important role to help get this back into formal negotiations or international cooperation mechanisms and really apply their tools of pressure and incentives for these actors to adopt those solutions. Um, and again, we've seen this in some of our operations in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, we are running an ecological dialogue between, um, between the conflicting parties there, which produces a lot of very creative solutions. And often we will be feeding those back to the OSCE in order to present them for, in a sense, formal consideration. Um, at a lower level, community level or track three mediation, I think you could, as Emma, showed actually really nicely there's a lot of climate sensitive action happening already which is good practice um, and she pointed out we need support from the eu and other players to strengthen capacities to strengthen expertise but i think also more importantly maybe it's um that it, it is just not enough for us to do that local work we need for it to be sustainable, really support and engagement at the state level, at the federal levels to push these governments to create a policy environment and to take actions that really enable and, on, and build on these local achievements um, and to safeguard them. Um, again, I think that's happening in some places in our own organization. I just wanted to highlight, for example, in Nigeria, our team mediates between farmers and herders for almost 10 years now. Um, but while they do that, they also engage state level governors and the federal level and more and more looking, for example, at supporting the national uh, um, livestock transformation plan. So to really have a comprehensive approach in action. And I think this is where the EU could come in quite nicely as a part, as a, as a practical partner to compl complement civil society's work. Um, and <clears throat> Sorry. And maybe for the EU specifically, I think um, civil society partners need support doing that. But it's also about recognizing that this will take a long time. Um, climate change issues are long term issues that need solving. And so we, we, would we do appreciate longer term partnerships with the EU responsive funding mechanisms, all those things that really enable our engagement on this, on this issue. Um, and really to sum it up, I thought 
it's about recognizing each other's limitations and contributions. I think as I try to show now, civil society has um, the ability to be, to be creative, to develop good solutions on environmental and peace issues, but limited direct influence on official processes. Whereas for the EU, to make it a bit pointed, it might be just the inverse. There's more influence on official processes, but less space for informal and creative solutions. Um, and if we take that into account, I think we can design very impactful EU and civil society corporations for the future. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed, Sebastian. And thank you all three of you for a fantastic uh, start to this, this session. Um, I'm going to invite uh, contributions from the floor, but before I do, I'm also going to invite Sebastian, who referenced a report, if that is publicly available, and anybody else who has written publicly available reports, uh, or even not publicly available reports that they're willing to share, do please um, put them in the chat box, which has to function as our publications table for this meeting. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, throw the, the, the floor open. We've heard very practical uh, res um, examples, uh, questions and recommendations uh, ranging from the, the highest diplomatic levels to some very uh, locally community-based uh, 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 undertakings. And I'd really like now for us to spend the rest of our time together to get deeper into how we, European Union civil society, can cooperate um, for more sustainable mediation, uh, mediation efforts in the context of uh, peace building and, and climate change. So please let's, um, we'd like to hear the examples of things that have worked. We'd like to hear questions that you have where you'd like one of our speakers to develop more on a point that have been made. And please either raise your hand or put it in the co comment box. I see uh, Peter Marsden from um, Concordis first. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, Peter and start with our first question, it's over to you. Well, good morning all and uh, my name is Peter Marsden, I'm Chief Executive of Concordis International. Um, a, a quick example if I may and that is working in uh, the north of Central African Republic and then into Chad and into Darfur, um, working on a local level peace building ostensibly around herding and farming, but also actually being able to work cross-border at a prefectural uh, or wallial level, uh, coming up with uh, agreements, uh, bilateral agreements, but at a local level. And we found that's been extremely useful um, because the force of pragmatism has uh, encouraged uh, those bilateral agreements, even when the, uh, the negotiations between the capital cities is going much more slowly. But uh, Renee, to, to, to respond to your, your point, I think the, a couple of your questions, the delegations can have a really important role in, in gathering some of the information that is gleaned. Uh, because there's a danger that we can all be working away in our pro, sort of program silos. Um, but actually, I think the delegations can host people uh, and bring people together and, and can have a really good role of capturing that data, if, if I may say. Uh, and secondly, actually, I think the delegations can have a role in facilitating these dialogues between those of us, uh, including some of us on the call who are working in similar spaces and coming up with action plans for how these programs can be taken to scale, because scale is something that you've talked about and something that is uh, massively needed. But thirdly, I think these um, those meetings can happen because the delegations can perhaps bridge that gap between private investors who are seeking to invest very heavily uh, in climate change uh, mit mitigation schemes uh, that you talked about and the risks that they pr they pose. And actually, the delegations might have a, a, a role in facilitating uh, dialogue between people from different disciplines, including those of us in the in the peace building sphere, perhaps also bringing in uh, colleagues from the uh, climate change sphere. So we've got decent climate science in the room and perhaps some of those from the uh, the from the private sector are seeking to to invest. And I wonder whether that might actually uh, answer some of your questions and say that even at a, a delegation level, um, those dialogues might happen quite effectively. And 
very quickly, if I may uh, indulge Laura, um, we find, but working at this sort of cross border level, climate science, climate is uh, climate change is no respecter of international boundaries and working across international borders is is part of what many of us do, particularly those of us working on sort of cross border transhumance. Um, with the funding instruments, there is a bit of flexibility around that. But generally, uh, you know, to work on the car Darfur border, we need to work both from uh, from the Sudanese delegation and with the Central African delegation. That's that's OK. But but those with a sort of appetite for that tends to be uh, come out of the FPI stall, um, which means that we're dealing with sort of short term political crises. But it, of course, that's quite short term. So we're always looking at 18 month grants. Uh, and uh, the point has been made already. Um, we're, we're looking for slightly longer term engagement, particularly when we're looking at heavy investment in, in climate change adaptation, as well as long term peace building programmes. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Nicholas or Nicola Sadu, you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Fiji and it's a question for Emma um, and you have to forgive me because we're in lockdown here in Sydney so I'm able to get a haircut so it's all disheveled. Um, I'm originally from Fiji but now living in Australia and the question for me to you is I understand what in, in South Africa or in the African continent as mostly North Pacific Islands they would have their own traditional conflict resolution processes. So in your training in, in Nigeria how much of the traditional practices did you sort of blend in with your mediation training? And if so, to what extent? Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, that's a great question. And um, I think your background is probably a screen, but it looks like things are really lovely in Australia, <laughs> um, despite lockdown. Um, that, yeah, that, that's a great that, question. That's actually a New Zealand lake, which I spent Christmas last year and since that oh. was my last one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, looks nice. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think, in, you know, our interest based negotiation approach really relies on existing sort of structures, both institutional, social, um, social networks, etc. Um, and through our process, we sort of identify um, local leaders, traditional leaders, religious leaders that have sort of wide acceptance um, and, and are seen to be inclusive um, and representative of sort of broader community groups. Um, and so um, in that sense of sort of embedding in those existing structures and traditions, um, we bring those traditional processes into sort of um, the, this newer sort of version of uh, mediation and negotiation. Um, and I think it's not about changing the structures or the, the roles of the leaders themselves, but it's really about equipping those leaders um, with the, the more sort of neutral and, and um, um, in uh, inviting dialogue skills that can sort of be responsive to a broader community sense. Um, but I think, you know, if you're, if you're alluding to the point of, you know, creating new structures and creating new systems, that's, that's not what we do. Cause we, I think um, probably most people on the call could agree that sort of thing is not sustainable or, um, or really going to be helpful. Thanks for the question though. Um, maybe if I can Thank just sort of, for uh, Nicholas as well, actually, Sebastian, Sorry, just the two fingers. Yes. Um, because that's, I think, spot on your point in terms of not duplicating it. And uh, in for us, it's quite a lot in the French speaking part of, of Africa, in Western Africa and Mali and Niger, where our teams have really tried to, in a sense, help reactivate existing kind of networks of mediators and traditional chieftain um, setups to to favor in a sense the the peaceful resolution of the management of common resources so i can they've they've done this for a few years now and i think it ended up being a big like network of local chieftains of almost a thousand almost mediators that mediate within communities within villages but really just highlighting the traditional way of doing it and complementing it with kind of the the good of what is new um, and so they've recently published a little booklet on that and how are they doing it. So I'll try to dig up the link and I'll, I'll send it over. Okay, thank you. That'd be wonderful. Does anybody else have um, a comment or discussion of 
uh, good practice, what's worked, or questions that they would like to pose. There is a question in the chat. Um, so, which, okay, sorry, there's a comment in the chat that I'd just like to draw your attention to on the panel, perhaps if you um, would like to, um, we'd like to respond to that when we come back. Um, Mohammed Adnan, uh, you would like to come in, please, the floor is yours. Mohammed, we can't hear you, I'm afraid. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, that's much better. C please go ahead. Okay, uh, ma'am, uh, my question is from uh, uh, Sir uh, Sebastian uh, regarding uh, water issues. As uh, I belong to Pakistan and uh, water is a core module in climate uh, uh, actions. So the question is, uh, there are many countries uh, from which uh, large rivers are flowing toward the downstream sites. And those countries which are on the upstream side are constructing dams, uh, which definitely leads to dispute between two countries. So uh, my question is, how? what is the strategy of European Union regarding uh, that kind of uh, disputes? How to overcome such kind of disputes? I think on how the EU does it, that's probably for René to say. <laughs> um, in general, again, it's a almost like Emma put it, it's a very interest-based negotiation approach. We'll, um, we would try, I would, I know that is such a big topic, so I can't go into it too, too much, but I think it's one of the topics where we would like those countries to negotiate for a win-win situation rather than a lose-lose situation and and we can help them find that that common ground potentially but you also find that a lot of countries are very closed to um, external intervention when it comes to those topics because it touches so much on very um, national security and very close national security issues for them um, you see it probably in your own country I think somebody mentioned the GERD, so the, the dam between Ethiopia and Sudan. Those are issues that are sparking conflicts. Um, so the dam is, in a sense, the trigger for future violent conflicts. You can see it between Sudan and Ethiopia these days. If you've been following the news, there's discussions about incursions across the border, um, military interventions linked to the disputes around those dams. So it just goes to show that I think the tools of mediation and discrete dialogue are really important for this issue. Um, but we are not quite there yet because often the upstream country obviously has a bigger sense of advantage and power and doesn't necessarily see the need to find that compromise potentially. Um, that's a bit of a generalization now, but... Um, so internally, if you are part of the machine, in a sense, um, I can just encourage you to, to, in a sense, present that those tools, those alternative tools to solving these issues um, to, your, to your apparatus almost <laughs> um, as a valuable means of f figuring these things out. But that's more of a general answer, maybe René, because I think there was the question to the EU specifically wants to come in. René, go ahead if you'd like to come in and then Emma, if you'd also like to respond and then I'll go to Lorenzo Angelini. His... Sure, Laura, would you like me to comment on some other things as well or, or, or just this question? Yes, if you wish, do, okay. do take the opportunity, yes. Great. Well, many thanks for, for, for comments and observations. Um, maybe start with Mohammed. Um, you know, I think Sebastian said it all. It, 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 these are very difficult issues. The first thing is, is there a willingness to talk? Um, as the EU, we will always try to nurture that willingness, uh, use our political leverage, use our, our contacts on the ground. 
to uh, to make that happen. And if there is, uh, then indeed uh, we we can support such uh, such processes. But um, it's very true that uh, if there is no willingness to talk, it is very very difficult. Uh, I think the GERD negotiations, so so with uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Uh, they show that this is a very, very difficult issue uh, that is now occupying us for, I don't know, at least 10 years, I think. Um, so no easy answer to that. Um, if you allow me, Laura, maybe quickly um, on the suggestion um, on the suggestion by Peter Marsden, um, I had the pleasure to spend 12 years of my, uh, of my uh, life working in delegations. So no, I could not agree more with you. Um, absolutely crucial. Uh, we have more than 140 delegations in the world. So basically every sort of country outside the EU, there is one. And these colleagues are at the front line. Uh, but I have to be honest, I mean, these colleagues are under tremendous pressure and it's very difficult often for them to respond to everything that, that, that comes their, their way. I know you have very close relations uh, with our delegation, so you know how they struggle. Uh, this is somewhere something where, where I think we can actually help each other. Um, this has become, in, in a relatively short period of time, such an important but such a complex issue that translating your findings from the ground, helping uh, colleagues to understand this and how to take that forward, I think is tremendously important. Um, we can be the, the conduit uh, there, so, so learning from you, translating that to our colleagues, that is part of what, what, what I'm trying to do. Uh, but your message is, is fully understood. Maybe briefly um, on the very good presentations, I really like them of Emma and, and uh, Sebastian. Um, Emma, uh, really fascinating. And you know, you have 2000 experts working on this. I can only be jealous. I mean, that is a phenomenal capacity. Um, I think we, we, you should even be less modest. Uh, uh, I would almost say shout it out uh, what you're doing. Make sure that everyone understands this. Uh, this is a, 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 a working modality. Demonst show what, what, what you are achieving, that this is a good way um, uh, and that it indeed is very important to make sure that you equip local leaders, that you are able to hold violence at an early stage um, and that you really need to, to invest in that. So make the case is, is, is what I would say and, and, and demonstrate uh, results uh, because that, that is in the end, I'm afraid, what matters. Um, Sebastian had some, some concrete suggestions. Maybe I will not go into all of them, but, but uh, you know, we, we, should, we should really continue this, this conversation. I think indeed um, you, you sort of point to the different roles that we play. And um, I, I think that is a very good point. I think our role as the EU is, is, is partially to create political space, to be a convener, use our convening power uh, to make sure that, that the achievement you have at a, at, at a track one and a half or two level is going up, is, is being translated at a political level. I mentioned very briefly that example of these projects in Nepal and Darfur. Well, when they started these projects where they tried to bring conflict and climate communities together, actually no one was interested. The climate community wanted to talk climate, the conflict community wanted to talk conflict, and we, they were actually not interested in the project because they didn't realize that, that this was uh, important to, to bring together. And the EU with its convening power could actually help and broker that. And, and so that was a very good um, uh, sort of suge suggestion on, on, on how we can play a constructive role there. That means that we really need to understand each other. Um, we need to understand what is happening at your level. Um, and indeed, delegations play a critical role in understanding your lessons, your messages, and to take that forward. Um, maybe I stop here, uh, Laura. I'm happy to come in later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. Emma, would you like to um, uh, address any of these questions or reflect on any of the comments that have been made so far? 
Uh, no, I think that's great. We, um, happy to leave space for other questions. Thanks. Maybe one point on Hector's question. Thank you. So, um, uh, just to wait, answer. just wait, Sebastian. Oh, I'm going to come to Hector's question. Thank you. So, um, I have uh, Lorenzo first, and then we will go to Hector. So, I would also look for um, perhaps another question or or observation, perhaps one or two, before going back to the the panel again. So, Lorenzo, over to you. That's all right. Uh, thanks. So I had two questions. Uh, one for Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian, you, you covered the importance of flexible and, and long-term funding. And we also hear uh, often about the need for integrated funding for engagements that combine climate adaptation and, and, and peace building. Uh, and I was wondering, um, would such integrated funding be relevant to your mediation work? Uh, could you expand on some of the recommendations that you would have for, for the European Union and other actors around uh, you know, the different types of funding that would be of most use to support your efforts. And then to, to all speakers, perhaps um, a, a, a question on um, to what extent you've seen the importance of taking into account gender as part of, you know, climate sensitive mediation efforts. Uh, we all know that climate change has, has gendered effects on, on, on different groups. Uh, diverse women and other groups can have a key role to play in, in mediation and conflict resolution efforts to bring about sustainable solutions. And, and I was wondering to what extent, uh, you know, this has been integrated in your work and, and if you would have good examples and good practices uh, to share in terms of integrating gender as part of climate sensitive mediation efforts. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lorenzo. And then um, we have the, the, question, the question from Hector Morales from the Humboldt University in Berlin. Taking into account that mediation in climate action process is starting to happen, what strategies can help break silos between the peace building and climate action communities and start joint programming for environmental peace building? Um, so I think perhaps we will, I'm going to come back to the the, the panel in reverse order, if that's all right. So maybe if we can start um, with you, Emma, if you would like to take any of those uh, questions uh, and and reflect on them. And then sure, I'll move way. to uh, Sebastian. Yeah. Sure, thanks, Laura. Those are great questions. Um, and thanks, Lorenzo, Lorenzo for, for mentioning the, the integration of gender. I think that's something that, um, Mercy Corps certainly considers to be sort of an integrated part of all the ways in which we work. However, obviously there can be, um, you know, potential to overlook um, gender integration when we just sort of assume that it that it's, you know, a part of the way we work. Um, I think what, what comes to mind is sort of two key, um, two key, well, one key way of, of, well, sorry, two key ways of including gender integration in, in climate sensitive mediation. Um, the first sort of relates back to Nicholas's point about um, who we are sort of choosing to work with in, in communities when we're doing mediation and negotiation programming. Um, and it's in consideration of sort of local leaders and, and um, officials that are representative of communities, but specifically including women. Um, I think traditional leaders and religious leaders often are not inclusive to sort of all community members and all groups. Um, so it's about sort of collaborating um, to ensure that all groups are included in those processes and, and where it's harder to um, for there to be specific initiatives to support sort of female and then women leaders in communities. Um, so one example that sort of comes to mind is um, in a program that we work on in northern Uganda in the Karamoja region. Um, and so a part of this program, we um, actually supported um, a women's peace forum um, with women sort of female peace leaders from various communities and created a sort of network um, of women peace leaders um, uh, from various communities that were previously in conflict. Um, so specifically, you know, supporting um, those female leaders with the um, dialogue and mediation skills that were also being um, given to sort of religious and, and traditional leaders. Um, and we actually found, interestingly enough, that the Women's Peace Forums initiatives were much more sustainable, much more proactive, and much more sort of successful, um, unsurprisingly, in, in um, negotiating um, sort of peace treaties and, and natural resource sharing agreements. Um, and actually, the Women's Peace Forums were so... Um, so successful um, that they were visited by sort of national level government of Uganda and now have um, developed um, sort of policies and standard operating procedures that are being funded by the Ugandan government um, sort of at the regional level to continue their, their activities. Um, and that's sort of seen as a, as a very successful initiative. Um, 
I can probably share some findings um, or, or report on that after the after this session. Um, I'll have to do a little digging. Um, and then for the second question around sort of breaking silos, um, this has been something that's been sort of talked about for some time as as we as you know the conversation ramps up around climate change and conflict. Um, what comes to mind, and I'm sure there's a lot more to be said here, is really around um, the framing and sort of operational approach um, that we come to um, these sort of complex problems with. So for Mercy Corps, for example, um, you know, we don't, as I mentioned in my sort of speech, we don't exclusively work on peace building, but we work um, across many, many different themes, including sort of food security, governance, um, uh yeah economic development market systems development etc and so um i think you know we take a systems approach where we look at the internet interconnected pieces in the way that um conflicts are sort of exacerbated and and um fueled by different dynamics um whether it being you know social environmental economic etc um and so we really both within our sort of global technical approaches and our um field sort of programming um, come together from those sectors um, to really discuss and collaborate and, and um, brainstorm and work with communities to sort of see the problems from a sector neutral approach. Um, but I understand, you know, from different um, donors and, and implementing agencies, obviously, the, a lot of times sort of climate colleagues are over here and conflict colleagues are over here. And so I think, you know, one way of, of really starting that is, is, is encouraging a conversation within your own organizations to say, how can we bring together climate colleagues and conflict colleagues to, to really, you know, discuss and brainstorm and, and collaborate um, around sort of identifying problems and solutions to problems um, and, and really trying to see problems from sort of a sector neutral uh, perspective rather than sort of saying this is a cl climate issue versus a conflict issue and really getting sort of used to um, tapping those colleagues from those other themes um, to come together when when um, you know developing programming or conducting assessments or that sort of thing uh, yeah I hope that answers the questions and thanks so much thank you very much Emma um, Sebastian would you like to respond to uh, any of those questions and then I'll come to you again Renee Sebastian Sure, very quickly. So I'll, on the silo question, I have um, what probably sounds like a much less sophisticated answer than Emma. Um, pick up the phone, I would say. Um, so over the last few weeks, I've been just calling up a whole lot of convention and biodiversity actors. And so we had a phone call with the convention on biodiversity. Um, and they were super open. We, you know, don't don't be shy. We wrote the Secretary General of the Convention of Biodiversity. We had an answer within a day and a phone call within two days. And great ideas how you can do that. Um, and we did that with a whole lot of other actors. So for us, it's really basically not overcomplicating it, but rather get it done imperfectly than um, waiting for the perfect solution. And um, that's turning out to work quite well um, because since we've started reaching out to those people. They are help. They are a set of climate experts that are helping us to ask better question in our assessments, um, to slightly restructure our process design. So, for example, we are kicking off a new dialogue or renewing a dialogue in Benue State in Nigeria, and as a kind of new addition, we have a natural resource expert and a land restoration expert or land reform expert as part of the process design team. And that is not fundamentally changing the peace process, but it is making it much better. And it's really actually quite straightforward. Um, what, one of the host organizations I think of the conference is Adelphi. Um, one of their experts has been helping us to discuss a regional climate link dialogue in Asia. And, you know, just having them in those planning calls has made hopefully our planning better, more robust. So it's really a very simple answer in a sense, but you need to do it. Um, and the fact that, as Emma said, this question has existed for so long, um, sometimes um, frightening almost, but unfortunately there's very easy solutions to that. Um, on the second question on gender in environmental peacemaking, very briefly, I think that's it's a bigger issue in the peacemaking and peace building community, which is slowly catching up to it. Um, I know at HD, we for it's maybe a year or two now, we have a much more dedicated um, attention to inclusion and inclusive peacemaking. Um, 
But I think the one point I wanted to briefly highlight was we had a very interesting evaluation of our Nigeria work done last year. Um, instead of kind of inviting the usual MNE evaluators, we invited anthropologists to look at our work in Nigeria. And what they really pushed us towards was much greater almost socioeconomic definitions of of inclusion, which resonated a lot with, I think, our teams in Nigeria. And very practically speaking, we're also seeing it. So for example, that really traditional, tradition-based mediation in, in Mali and in the Sahel, um, they have a very active approach to inclusion that includes socioeconomic groups, farmers, pastoralists, fishers, market people, traders, um, women groups, young people, elder groups. Um, so it's a really a context-specific notion of inclusion. Um, and But the one group that it excludes is um, state authorities, in a sense, because to avoid politicization of those, of those groups. Um, but yeah, it's very important, um, but it's a big topic, so I'd rather leave it there. Um, on flexible integrated funding mechanisms from, I think, Lorenzo. Um, I think, as Peter said, many donors, the EU including, prefer one year to 18 months funding arrangements, which, you know, we can work with that. Um, but peace processes don't last 18 months, but we all know that they last 18 years rather than 18 months. Um, so it can become a bit tricky. Um, managing your engagements around that. But I think um, there is progress step by step during, I don't know, over during COVID, we had a few more thematically themed grants, I think, which worked really well. Um, and just to give a non-EU linked example from one of our other donors, we had a very small, in a sense, seed funding grant that gave us a lot of flexibility over six months. And with a very modest amount, we managed to, I think, do four very successful interventions in that environmental space because of an established trust relationship between the government partner and us. Um, and not just funding, it's also a political partnership. So we are co-hosting some of those dialogues together, etc. So I think that's quite a nice, nice way of doing it. And we're seeing more and more funding arrangements that bring together already the environmental and the peace actors in the setup of a funding arrangements. Personally, I think that's quite nice um, and a good way to go, but it obviously also details, uh, devils in the details of how you, how you manage that. Thank you, Sebastian. Rene? Oh, sorry, had you, you had finished. Good, okay, sorry. Rene. Great, many thanks, uh, Laura. I mean, this, this thing of, of, of silos is, is, is clearly important. Um, and uh, I'm happy that Sebastian is noting some, some good progress. Uh, I, I think that's, that's great. Um, I think we collectively have to keep making uh, the point. Uh, we are at the start of a new seven year period of, of, of funding, uh, what we call the, 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 the uh, multi-annual financial framework. This is a good moment to, 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 to make that point. I am not responsible for funding. Let, let me be very clear about that. Um, so, so it is the colleagues in the European Commission that, that, that take this forward. So I, I cannot take any decision there. I know they're very sensitive to these arguments. Uh, and so a, a good presentation of, of what is necessary um, is, is, is certainly not uh, uh, sent to, to deaf ears. Uh, they are looking for, um, for, for good proposals there. Um, interesting what Sebastian also says, you know, you bring in a land reform and an environmental degradation expert as part of your sort of mediation or peace process. That's a whole new way of working. Um, and I think that is a good illustration of how important this is and, and what the implications are. Uh, for me, uh, climate change and, and everything that it stands for is, is, is not just a new sector, something that we you know, can mainstream, we do additionally, we have a, a, a sort of a work plan. I, I think it, 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 unfortunately, I must say, it will become so important that other processes will have to be adjusted in order to deal with, um, with climate change at large. 
So I think it is really um, something that, that will have significant implications on a lot of organizations, on a lot of funding streams, on a lot of decisions that are going to be taken. Um, and so in that sense, um, I, I think this dialogue is very timely and, and, and certainly merits um, follow-up. Um, I totally agree on everything that has been said about gender. If you want to make any, any change in this area, um, I think women are a lot more uh, sensitive to, to these issues. Um, and, and inclusion is, is, of course, at the heart of the EU uh, mediation process. Uh, when you read our mediation concept, you will see that as, the, uh, as, as one of the, the key pillars that, that we are uh, promoting. Let me just see if there's anything that I missed. Um, I don't think so. Let me stop here, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And um, on the subject of gender, I'd like to draw your attention to the two events, the two panel events that Johanna has put in the chat, um, which also deal with uh, gender sensitivity and the climate, uh, crisis, uh, climate change. So thank you very much for that, Johanna. Um, Lorenzo, Lorenzo Conti, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I have a question for Renee and another also for Emma and Sebastian, actually, um, with your uh, answer right now, you kind of already touched up on this, but I just wanted to, um, well, since you, you explained how significant was the progress in, in integrating climate change and conflict analysis, and in general, how important it is for informing other engagements, I just wanted to know if you had any additional comments on how climate sensitive conflict analysis can be used to inform in general the, 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 the work on conflict prevention and perhaps specifically mediation since it is also one of the pillars or at least like one one theme that was uh, that is included in the in the new concepts um and also how you see this uh developing moving forward um and to to Emma and Sebastian I wanted to to ask well on the basis of this um let's say this new um well not new but this um the acknowledgement of this uh, linkage between uh, climate and peace if you actually saw any positive uh, uh, developments any kind of change of attitude from the international governmental um, actors uh, donors like the eu but also the un or maybe you said uh, if you saw any any specific and positive developments uh, on on your work you done with them with them or your just your uh, interactions with them thank you Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo Conti. So this is um, this is the last opportunity to make a question or a comment. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our time, unfortunately. But if there is anybody who would like to intervene, please raise your hand now or put your name in the chat. Um, and uh, if I don't see any hands or any names in the chat, then I would like to pass uh, back to our panel to respond to uh, Lorenzo and then to Olivia's uh, questions. Just one second, Olivia. So I will go back to the panel. I will start in the uh, reverse order from how we started. So I'd like to start with Emma, followed by Sebastian. Uh, sorry, I'd like to start with Sebastian, followed by Emma, and finishing with Renee um, to address these questions and also to offer us any uh, final uh, closing thoughts. So, um, Olivia, over to you and to everybody else. If you have a burning question, you weren't quite sure whether to put put it. Well, put raise your hand while Olivia is speaking, and then after Olivia, we will go straight to Sebastian. Olivia, please. Thank you very much, um, Olivia K. Max from Conciliation Resources EU Mediator. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to raise a, a, another dimension, and that's of digitalization, because it has an impact, obviously, both on climate change and on peace processes and mediation. And um, I'll leave whoever is comfortable answering, but I wonder how that may have crippled into um, maybe mandates or peace processes or negotiations both as um, providing opportunities, but challenges as, as well in terms of uh, information and, and disinformation flow, but also in terms of the um, 
need an appetite for natural resources to fill these needs in terms of digitalization and how that may sort of play out into um, negotiations and talks between different groups. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, Lorenzo, for the, the final round of questions. So I'd like to turn back to our panel. You have each about three minutes if you'd like to respond to anything that has just been raised or and to make any uh, final thoughts. So, Sebastian, over to you to be followed by Emma. Um, to start with Lorenzo's first question, climate sensitive an an analysis, maybe not very elaborate thoughts, but um, for us, it is a, it just becomes part of good standard analysis in a sense. We cannot ignore those questions anymore because they drive conflict, but also provide possibilities for, for solutions. Um, so I think actors like HD, they are all about the creative entry points, the creative solutions that are blocked to official actors. And there the environment is often a, a good starting point. But I think, as Rena said, it's also easily becomes politicized. So it's really about good conflict analysis. So um, for me, it's the climate sensitivity, gender sensitivity. You know, it's it's a long list that makes your conflict assessment good, but it also makes it strategic in the sense of then identifying what are the issues that will allow you to actually address. Um, with the main political issue or instead of the political issue. Um, so there isn't, again, one, one, one solution to it. But for me, kind of the future of mediation is just a greater attention to those thematics in the peace processes. Um, mediators need to be more comfortable talking about climate, about gender, about all those things. Um, and they need to be better at integrating it into their processes. So that, that assessment phase and that um, analysis phase is really key to that. Um, on digitalization, Olivia's point, um, that, that is such a big point. I'm, I'm not sure how to, to answer it. It's, it gave us a lot of opportunities on, I'd say on the more local level. So recently, actually also in Nigeria, we had the first ever sort of social media online peace agreement where communities agreed on online behavior and offline behavior together. Um, it didn't necessarily link to natural resources only, um, but often around natural resources or higher level negotiations, when it touches on that, it becomes very sensitive. Um, so I think that's where the limits of the digital realm can be felt, um, that certain negotiations you, you will not have online. Um, so, but I know that's a very short answer to a big question. And maybe to use Lorenzo's second question as my final comment, um, is there change in official actors? Are there any developments, positive or negative? And maybe just to close for saying that's the environmental or climate realm might be one of the fortunate areas where donor interests and governmental interests and local interests collide. Um, because often you'll hear practitioners complain that they'll have to follow donor interests or vice versa. And this is here one space where we really want to go and push in the same direction. And so I'm quite optimistic. I'm very excited actually in, for this space. A lot is happening. Um, so one of my hats at HD is being the environmental focal point in the, for the organization and it's brewing. So HD is extremely decentralized organization. We have, I think we work in almost 40 countries in 40 conflicts and our headquarters cannot dictate what our teams will do on the ground, but almost all the teams have ideas of how it links to their processes and how it links to the conflicts and what they want to do. So this is something that is coming that is demand driven from our mediators. Um, but it's falling on very open ears from the donors. Um, the trick will be how we'll figure out good arrangement, good partnerships that will allow that positive development to really go forward. But I'm quite excited by it. Uh, it's like an op almost an open invitation to any government re representative in the room. We have so many ideas <laughs> how to do this. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great space to be in at the moment. Um, and it's on us to really make it happen.
Great. Thank you, Sebastian. Great place to leave it. Emma, please, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Lorenzo, I'll just answer your, or, or I'll respond to your question about sort of positive developments. And, um, you know, while I echo a lot of what Sebastian said, um, I'll just add a little bit more. You know, Mercy Corps has been working on the nexus of climate change and conflict for many years. And certainly um, in the last year, we've seen an exponential amount of interest from donors, international community, um, and sort of practitioners in this space. Um, you know, sadly, I think that's largely because climate change has been so present in the last year, you know, from the floods in Germany, fires sort of across the globe, um, but also because of, um, I think, a large role that the US government has played in renewing sort of global interest in climate change and, and putting that at the front and center of the agenda. Um, so what, you know, while we've seen a huge amount of um, interest, and I think as Sebastian has said, you know, open ears of, of donors, um, there are a couple of barriers that um, we still have to address to really take action in this space. Um, and so for Mercy Corps, you know, we really present climate change and conflict and, and we think about it as a way to, um, you know, as a better use of resources um, to say, you know, the promotion of climate adaptation and the reduction of drivers of fragility can really enable a better use of resources because you're creating a sort of positive feedback loop of, you know, peace, positive climate action where you can you know, safeguard climate adaptation and peace outcomes against future risk by addressing those two together. Um, but some of, the, some of the barriers really, and um, I'll just drop that we're gonna be releasing a paper on some of these barriers um, in the coming weeks, so look out for that. And unfortunately I can't share it today, but um, yeah, talking about a couple of the barriers to action and, and sort of our suggestions for way forward. But two of those um, that I'll just touch on are um, the, the sort of, climate security assessments and the neutrality um, and non-sector spe specificity of assessments. Um, you know, I think that part of um, what's blocking action in this space is that practitioner organizations like, like Mercy Corps don't currently have the tools to, you know, do an assessment of, you know, whatever scale um, of intervention or program is going to be designed, whether that's, you know, regional, landscape, community level, et cetera. Um, we don't necessarily have the tools to be able to very concretely sort of draw narrative pathways that link climate change and conflict and point to very concrete action points for entry um, so and to sort of design interventions around that. Um, so that's actually something that we're going to we are working on currently um, and hope to share with the sort of broader development community in the in the coming year um, after we pilot it in a couple of contexts. Um, and the second um, barrier is really a catch-22, and this and this is not um, a unique challenge to the climate change and conflict space, but sort of broader development community. Um, and that's really that um, we need evidence um, of what works um, in this space to to you know get more funding and get more programming and more piloting. But we need uh, the programs to get that evidence. And so, you know, luckily we've seen there has been a fair bit of interest from donors to, to, to invest in that sort of piloting and scaling of um, really innovative programming, um, you know, from, from CETA and the German government, um, even obviously not in the EU, but um, FCDO. Um, there's been interest at, at quite a small scale in investing in um, that more innovative and, and exploratory um, programming. Um, and so I think, you know, as this conversation get, gets bigger and there's more not notable sort of integration of different um, actors and things like COP26 and the, the recent sort of assessments around um, or comments around the General Assembly, um, I think there's a lot more interest and I think I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more um, opportunity in the sort of coming months and, and year. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Anna. Renee? Many thanks to Laura. Um, really interesting exchange. Um, I think uh, Sebastian actually stole my speaking points. Uh, I, I will come to that later. It's, it's, um, I think it's interesting to uh, see how um, how many similarities there are. Uh, two concrete things, um, and, and then maybe sort of an overall observation, if, if, you, if that's okay. Uh, I think there was a question of how do you include climate change in your conflict analysis work? Well, we actually have just completed two pilots where we have said we are going to make a conflict analysis and climate change is the issue we're going to look at. We had said, for, for, for a long time, climate change is to be mainstreamed. We are taking that along in the analysis and it never led to any, any significant uh, uh, change in the analysis itself. Now we made this the main issue. 
and it created a huge difference. So I, I hope we can uh, find uh, some, some discrete ways to, to, to share some of these findings. We have many more very relevant entry points. We much better understand how climate change uh, has an impact on the conflict dynamics, on conflict partners. And from this experience, we have a much better indication of how to take this forward. So um, mainstreaming doesn't work. You really need to have an explicit focus on this. Although I totally agree with uh, Emma's uh, uh, um, plea for what she calls a non-sector specific uh, assessment. Um, I like uh, Emma's suggestion uh, and, and I recognize her problem saying, you know, we, we, we don't have the concrete tools yet that lead us to concrete actions. And I'm really interested in your work, Emma. So, so if, if indeed you have uh, next year uh, uh, findings of that, very happy to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to see what you've come up with. Um, need evidence on what works? Absolutely. I'm afraid that is what it, we need. We need not only evidence, you, we also need you to communicate about this. Um, communicate about this works, this helps. Uh, because that, in the end, um, will trigger politicians to take uh, decisions on resource allocations that, that really make a difference. Last point I want to make is um, indeed what Sebastian said. We have here the same agenda. Uh, our interests are completely the same. And that is true at, at uh, so many different levels. Uh, so indeed, I think we, we, we sort of all feel we are, we are uh, pushing open doors, um, and we really need to, you know, keep keep indeed pushing and finding structures to keep informing each other, create these linkages in country, indeed with the delegations at headquarter level through uh, meetings like this. Um, there is so much happening at this moment. It's it's almost, uh, you know, it's a real challenge to to keep up with with all of that. So meetings like this, bringing all of that together on a regular basis is, is tremendously useful. Um, maybe it can even be more focused uh, on methodologies, on trainings, on, on, on particular experiences so that we can really help each other there in order to scale up. Because for me, that is one of the main challenges that we collectively have. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Renee. And I think that it's safe to say that we at EPLO are looking forward to developing and deepening uh, these conversations as we can. I would like to thank everybody for your participation today um, in what has been a very, very interesting, a very forward-looking and a very solution-oriented conversation. Uh, we have a lot of recommendations to work on, all of us from civil society as well as from the EU side. Um, and I would particularly like to thank our speakers, Renee Van Ness from the European External Action Service, Emma Whitaker from Mercy Corps and Sebastian Kratzer from the HD Center. And of course, I'd like to thank Adelphi and the German Federal Foreign Office for organizing the Berlin Climate Security Conference of which this panel has been part. If you, as they say, like this and would like to follow more, please look at the EPLO website, eplo.org and follow us on social media. And this meeting, you'll be able to share with your colleagues who missed it, where were they? Um, when it goes onto our YouTube channel in the coming days. So for the rest, I'd like to thank you all and I'd like to wish you a very good rest of your day and we look forward to taking these conversations and deepening them and not only as conversations, of course, but as practical cooperation actor uh, actions in the future to build more sustainable mediation efforts in the context of climate change. And with that, I'd like to wish everybody a very good day and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>